On today's episode of The Arthropologist, I'm interviewing award-winning mystery writer John Floyd. John, welcome to The Arthropologist. I am so excited to talk to you today. Um, you know, just to let everyone know, we've known each other for I don't know how many years, but we really got to know one another when you came and sat for me in the studio, which I filmed and is actually up on YouTube. When we, we spent the morning together, and as I painted your portrait, it was fascinating to hear you talk about your career as a mystery writer and how you work at your craft. At the time, I'd been toying with the idea of starting a podcast that would focus on, you know, interviewing people in the arts, and you and I talked about it, and now here we are. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. If I could... Let me tell the listeners a little bit about your accomplishments, and you correct me if at any time I get something wrong, but <laughs> okay, your work has appeared in more than 300 publications, including Strand Magazine, Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, Woman's World, Mississippi Noir, and the print edition of the Saturday Evening Post. You're also... And I want you to talk about these a little bit later because I, I just thought this was just was amazing. You're an Edgar Award uh, nominee, a four-time Derringer Award winner, a three-time Pushcart Prize nominee, and the 2018 recipient of the Edgar Edward D. Hotch Memorial Golden Derringer Award for Lifetime Achievement. That's a mouthful. Um, it is. Yes, and I saw that one of my heroes, Lauren D. Esselman, was one of, I think it said that there are only 22 who have received this award. And um, Right. Uh, Esselman's one. I think Lawrence Block is one. I was in some, I was in some good company there. Uh, Bill, I, I was very fortunate. Absolutely. And uh, your stories have been selected for inclusion in the 2015, 2018, and 2020 editions of Best American Mystery Stories and the 2021 edition of uh, best mystery stories of the year, um, and is that the one that James Patterson edited? James Patterson guest edited Best American Mystery Stories in 2015, uh, and uh, Louise Penny <clears throat> Louise Penny did the one for 2018, and uh, C.J. Box for 2020. The one that's coming up in 2021 uh, is guest edited by uh, Lee Child. But Otto Penzler, Otto Penzler from New York is the series editor for those. Gosh, they've been going on uh, since the late 90s, I think. Yeah. Just, once, just a, an annual mystery anthology. And you've, you've had your, your stories compiled into nine books. Is that right? Actually, they've been com compiled into, uh, into seven books. And one's coming up soon. Okay. Uh, and then, and then the the uh, other book is a collection, believe it or not, of uh, poetry, of short poems. And even though I am not really a poet, these are little uh, little ditties, little uh, it's light verse that uh, three hundred little pieces of those that I've sold in places like Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, Writer's Digest, Farm and Ranch Living, places like that. That's just a lot of fun. I had a great time with that. Yeah, uh, that's great. Well. I'm I'm just going to say this is amazing. I forget sometimes the really <laughs> talented, famous people that I know. And uh, uh, it's not until, I mean, you know, somebody like you, I just think of as my friend. And then the next thing I know, it's like, well, you do know this guy's super famous. <laughs> so, uh, you are very, you are very kind. You are very kind. Uh, w did you want to share a little bit of your bio with people? You know, I, I know you, uh, you were, uh, in the Air Force, you worked for um, IBM a little bit, and, and just share a little bit about that, because that may come up in a little bit when we talk about your writing. Sure. Oh, I was born here in Mississippi in Atala County, a little town called Salas on Highway 12, Atala County, and um, I attended Cosiesco High School and uh, Mississippi State. I graduated, believe it or not, in electrical engineering, which, which why I'm doing this uh, after graduating in engineering, I have no idea, but... But I worked then for IBM for, um, I was in the Air Force for four years on a leave of absence. I doubt they even have leaves of absence anymore for the military. But I went to work for IBM and then went off on a four-year uh, military leave of absence uh, in, in Oklahoma City, Tinker Air Force Base. Then I went back to uh, IBM and stayed there 30 years. And uh, they sent me all over the world. Uh, great company to work for. Uh, 
I retired from there, and um, one of the things that I've done, too, is uh, at night, for 17 years, I taught fiction writing classes at Millsaps, which was great fun. Oh, man, I, I met just some wonderful, wonderful folks there and, and had a great time. But, but now I'm um, happily retired and worthless. Uh, I write stories and mow the yard when it needs it, and that's, that's, pretty much, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Well, okay, the questions I have, they're not necessarily in any particular order. So you said something that made me want to go off in this direction. You know, you said you worked for IBM for 30 years and retired. I did. Uh, now, thinking of aspiring writers, I know that so many of their working jobs they don't like, and they're just desperate to be doing what they want to do. Was that the, the uh, is that part, part of your story, or did you really enjoy what you were doing and wrote on the side and then really picked it up when you retired, or did you always really wish you were a, a full-time writer? No, I wish I could tell you I had always been um, a, a writer. I, I was not in high school and college. I liked math and science. I uh, didn't like English. Um, and it turned out that I came upon writing late in life and in the 40s. And, and really, I think I'm fortunate, Bill, because I joke about this to friends and family, but if I had discovered my love of writing when I was 20 years old, my family would probably have starved. Okay, so it was really better to have had a career that I enjoyed. I really liked my job at IBM, and it was, it was in finance mostly. I specialized in finance industry applications. And... Um, it was though after my retirement that I really started. That I really started writing. Started writing for publications. Started sending things in. Uh, I might have told you this before, but uh, in a, in the gosh, in the nineties, I guess the early nineties, I started sending in some of these manuscripts that I've been working on. I've been playing with. I have stories piled up all over the house. Uh, and my wife finally said, "Why don't you send some of these in and see if somebody will publish it?" Because I've just been writing these little stories for several years, playing, and so. Um, so I did, and I was just incredibly lucky because several of those first stories I sent out were accepted and published. And I was, I was just, it was luck. It was more luck than talent, I'm sure. Um, but it was, it was great for me because it proved to me that, you know what, you really can do this. I mean, it really can be done because you know that so many of you and my friends who are writers try for an awful long time before they got something published. It is, it's kind of a, Roll of the dice sometimes, whether it's a novel or a short story, kind of a roll of the dice because a certain editor has to like your, like a certain story on a certain day of the week almost for you to wind up getting something published. So I was very fortunate there. And and once I started and once I started buying these stories, oh man, it was addictive. I mean, it really was. And I just just kept writing stories and kept sending them up. I've been doing that ever, ever since. I, mean, I hope I'm a little better at it than I used to be. Uh, most folks get better when they the more they do something. I, I usually joke and say, except for golf, yeah. you know, you, you get better at it the more you do. And um, it, it's just so much fun. I have a great time dreaming up these little stories and putting them on paper. Okay, well, I want to get into the craft a little bit because right. I, I read some of the uh, reviews and uh, that people have, and they were really fascinating and brought up some really interesting questions like, Hank, is it Flippy or Philippi? Yeah, Philippi. Yeah, Philippi Ryan. Hank Philippi Ryan. And believe it or not, that's a lady. <laughs> it's, it's not a guy; it's a lady. Oh, really? Okay. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, she's a, she's a great she's a great writer, best selling author. Yeah, she's uh, the author of Trust Me. Okay, I'm going to read the quote, and then I want to ask you about it. She said, "John Floyd is a, is a star. The Barons, mesmerizing tales." are exactly why we love short stories. Yes, each one is completely entertaining. Yes, each one is a polished gem. And yes, and here we go, Floyd is the king of dialogue. With elegant elegance and wisdom and a twist around every corner, Floyd creates unforgettable characters in this treasure of a collection not to be missed. And here's the question. You know, she said, you were the king of dialogue. It is so hard to make dialogue for characters that are really authentic, to feel genuine. Tell us, tell us about the, your process for creating dialogue for your characters. 
Well, at first, I probably need to send her a check for saying those things. I mean, I was very, very uh, pleased and honored that she said that. Uh, dialogue is fun. Bill, the biggest thing about dialogue is an awful lot of fun to write and to read. People love to read people talking about themselves, about people talking to them, to each other. And um, I've heard that books, bookstore owners tell me that when, when someone comes in and is looking for something to read by someone, maybe who they don't know, whose name already they don't know, they're just looking for something new to read, they'll go to the bookshelves and start looking through them and find, they'll look for white space. They'll look for, they'll look for dialogue because people just love to read that. And uh, it is great fun to write, I think. It's hard to do, as you said, because it's so important that we write in a way that makes you feel that people are really saying this but without including all the little inane things that we say to each other in real talk. You know, the pauses and the stammering, the kinds of things that we do when we talk with each other. And so it, it, it's something that I think the key to it, and maybe not the key to it, but one of the, one of the ways that you can be sure you're writing pretty good dialogue is read it out loud. After you've read, read it out loud, if something's wrong, you'll know it immediately, you know, because it sounds wrong. And, and, and so, so many times, it's you don't want to write in a way that would be grammatically correct. You want to write in a way that sounds right. And you certainly want to use contractions and those kinds of things. You know, you, you can write something that says, uh, well, I think I will go see my friend. I hope he is doing well. I mean, you don't write that way because we don't talk that way. You put the contractions in and make it sound real. And to do that, I think, is so much fun. It's and it's almost like cheating in a way when you write stories with a lot of dialogue because you you always heard we need to show and not tell. Right? Dialogue's a great way to do that. Dialogue's a wonderful way to do that. When, when people are talking with each other, things are happening. Things are moving. And it's not like description and exposition and all those things that take. Uh, that maybe might be a little tiring when you read. So I, I love to write dialogue. Love to write dialogue. Now, I think I read that Faulkner would... Uh kind of haunt uh, restaurants and greasy spoons and juke joints and things like that. And he would sort of hide in a corner and eavesdrop on people's conversations because he wanted to get authentic expressions, of authentic uh, turns of phrases. Do you do that or do you read other books or where are you getting some of it? You know what? I had heard that about Faulkner. I heard the same kinds of things about others, others who are known for dialogue, like Elmore Leonard and others, that they, they eavesdrop. I mean, they honestly listen to other people talk and try to pick up the little tiny things in what we say that make it sound real. Uh, or that when you write it, it would sound, sound real. I'm not sure I'd do that, uh, consciously, but yeah, you, you have to, you have to try to, you have to try, try to make dialogue, you know what, you want to make it realistic without making it real right. you want you want to write you want to get the point across you know move the plot forward or tell the reader something about a character through an exchange of dialogue you want to make sure it does the job when you're right but you also just want to make it sound like someone's really talking with each other a friend of ours ben douglas who writes uh, novels uh, he's uh here in jackson he told me once that uh, he said it's great the great thing to do with dialogue, if you're a writer, is look back at what you've written and it takes some of the words off the front of the sentence. He said, uh, instead of saying, uh, uh, you know, let's, you want to go get, you want to get something to eat? Just say, want to get something to eat. Not, not do you want to get something, just want to get something to eat. That's the way we talk. Right. And, uh, and, and sure enough, just as you said, you don't know those things unless you listen to people or you pay attention to the way you talk yourself. Uh, but you want to know those things, and you want to get those things down on paper because it sounds, it, it, when it's read, it's right. It sounds right to the reader. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> I, I've written some. I had a ongoing cartoon that I published every week for almost 11 years with the same characters. And in my experience, and it was just me, but at times, once my characters were in a, particular place and I knew them so well once they got to talking I don't mean to be too mystical about it or anything like that but it was like I would be <laughs> listening to them because I wasn't putting words in their mouth it was like um, uh, 
the characters Pippin, Max, and Dorf were the three characters mainly that I had in this cartoon. And you knew from their personalities, if something happened, this was going yep. to be their reaction. And literally, if I put them into a place, they would they would start talking, and I was really just kind of listening and dictating. Does that happen to you? Well, the reason you do that, I'm sure, is it just felt so natural. You knew those characters. Sure, it does happen. And it takes a wonderful thing that it does, because it means that you are in, enough in touch with your characters that... Uh, that you do know how they're going to uh, how they're going to talk how they how they're going to act too of course and uh, that's one thing you have to be careful about when you're a writer of course is that you don't want a character to say something that he or she wouldn't say uh, a professor a college professor is going to talk in a different way than than someone who who usually works in the field all day I, and, and you, you want to make everything sound right you want the reader to say I can believe it he or she is saying that, you know, right. and sometimes, sometimes you, you probably heard that writers sometimes obsess over how much to uh, put in speaker attributes. In other words, he said, she said, those kinds of things. When when your dialogue is good enough, sometimes you don't have to do a lot of that. You could have a conversation between a highway patrolman and someone who's been speeding, uh, you know, at the, at the traffic stop that you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't even even have to say that so and so said or so and so said because. What they said, from what they said, it would be apparent who's speaking. Um, dialogue is just dialogue is just a whole. Uh, it's an adventure in itself. It's fun to write and fun to read. Well, since we're sort of going in this direction, uh, something you said made me think about a question I've got for later, and I'll just put it now. Um, as far as like putting words into your character's mouth, along those same lines. Uh, there are writers, and I can't think of her name right now. I really like her uh, detective fiction, but gosh, sometimes she can get so political. And even when I might agree with her, she gets so heavy-handed with it that it seems like she's really just trying to use her character as a platform to preach her particular uh, gospel at that time. And I was wondering... Do you ever have to fight with that, or do you even care? I mean, you're just really trying to spin a good yarn, and you're not trying to necessarily change well, people's minds on something. I think the main thing, of course, is, sure enough, to tell a good story in whatever way. You have to do that, but, yeah, I am conscious of that, and I try not to do that. And there's certain writers, I won't call names, but certain writers that both of us know, but I don't really enjoy reading that much, even though they're wonderful writers, writers because they have it. It's not only a message in what they're writing. It's they, it's, it's actually it's actually preaching. It really is. They're they're overdoing it a bit and letting some of their political beliefs leak in to the point that it's distracting. And that, that's what's. And I think that's the problem. That's what you have to watch out for. From what you said, the writer you're talking about writes in such a way that it actually distracts you from the story. And man, that's just never a good thing. Whatever does that is wrong. Uh, and, and, and political beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, political beliefs, it's just almost like they'll say, you know, just leave politics out of and politics and religion out of what you're talking about, if you're talking with family or friends. And it's the same kind of thing with stories. Some writers can't resist it. Uh, we talked about Lawrence Block a minute ago, and I love his writing. Uh, he's a wonderful man in person. Um, but... Uh, some of his stories, and it's uh, the the alcoholic anonymous, uh, alcoholics anonymous um, side of it, just got to be a little too much. His character really struggled with with drinking, and gosh, some of it, some of that just got to be a little too much. Um, it happens with so many, so many writers that you read. I try, I do try to stay away from that. It's not that hard to stay away from, from that kind of thing, but yeah, yeah, you do have to be conscious of it, right? Okay, well, here's another quote, of course, from the world-famous James Patterson. If James Patterson says anything about you, you're, you've, you've made it at least <laughs> to some degree, even if it's bad. Okay, he wrote, Molly's Plan by John M. Floyd details the formation and execution of a bank heist so real and intense that I find it impossible to believe the tale took up only a few pages, an imaginative twist 
an imaginative twist at the end of the story makes it a truly satisfying read. Now, my question, because this sort of sparked something in my mind, <clears throat> how do you avoid, when he was talking about the uh, imaginative twist at the end and all, how do you avoid the deus ex machina, or machina, the God in the machine syndrome, when creating a tale with a lot of twists and deep complexity, and frankly, just plot holes. I, I work in the movie industry, and so I listen to a lot of um, screenwriters that will mm -hmm. talk about their work. And I yeah. don't know if Ocean's Eleven was, a, was ever a book or if it was just a movie, but whoever wrote the screenplay, at least, um, he said he couldn't figure out how to get some of the people into the positions in the casino in any sort of realistic way. And so they just <laughs> skipped it. I mean, they put them in there, but it was just like, they're not here. The next thing you know, somebody's in the vault. How'd they get there? We have no idea, but on the story goes. <clears throat> and of course, it's such an amazing, fun ride that you really don't care. But when you sit down and you really analyze the story, it's like, oh my gosh, none of this could have happened at all. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Now, I don't think you can probably get away with that as easily as you can in a book as you can in a movie. But Me too. Do you have problems like that where it's like at at the end it's just like, okay, God in the machine and, and move on? Or do you really try to hammer out and make sure everything has at least some cogent uh, tie together where it actually works? I think you do have to have to try to be careful to tie up the loose ends and make sure you haven't stretched the truth too far. Uh, I mean, all this, I think everyone believes fiction writers understand that what they're reading is a pack of lies. Okay, then they know that, and, and and they don't mind. But you can't get too far fetched with that kind of thing. I think. One way to do that, a lot of little ways to make sure you've done the right kinds of things. With twist ending, you can't. You have to be careful not to uh, just bring something out of the ether. I mean, just just produce something that hasn't been mentioned before, or that's just going to sound too too amazing when it happens. One way to do that is to plant something earlier in the story that makes later action believable. It's called foreshadowing, and. Um, I remember a movie I watched a while back. I think it was Anthony Hopkins and Alec Ball, and they were out running around the last of the bear chasing. It was called uh, The Edge. It was called The Edge. That was it. And about midway through, one of the two of them falls into a bear pit. He's about to kill the other, the other one, and just before he could shoot him, he fell into a bear pit, backed up and fell into a bear pit. Well, what happened was, earlier in the movie, toward the beginning of the story, it was mentioned a guide was talking to some other folks and said, oh, You'll have to be careful not to not to step, see that over there. That's a bear pit. Be careful because you don't want to step into that. Because that was mentioned early, later when it was introduced in the movie, everybody thought, oh, fine, I accept that. That's fine. But you have to make sure that the readers with you or the viewer or whatever is with you all the way along, or it's just not going. It's just not going to work. These twist endings are great when they work. They can fall flat when they when they're not plan well enough. Right. Uh, I, I just have to, Bill, I'm one of these people who has to plan. I've got a plot, plan it out in my head, work through the plot in my head before I ever start writing. It may change once I sit down and start, but I've got to have that structure in my head before I start uh, in order to do the writing. And that's, there are two different kind of people, and there's one, you probably heard them called Seat of the Pantsers. Pantsers, they just sit down, they start with a blank page, they start writing, and they don't worry about planning anything. They just start writing and see where the story goes. And they said to know the story ahead of time, to know the ending ahead of time, would stifle their creativity. They like to do it that way. I say I envy those people, but I'm not one of those writers. I have to work it out in my head first and have the safety net underneath me as I write the story. And it involves those twists. We... You have to make sure the groundwork is laid and that everything's logical throughout your story. It's a long way to answer that, isn't it? No, actually, as you're talking, I, I don't know if the 
listeners will hear some clicks, but that's me actually highlighting and deleting questions that you're answering oh. before they're asked. So, <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yes, yes. So this is fantastic. Uh, along those same lines, again, I was listening to uh, a really great screenwriter and on YouTube, and he was saying, write your villain first because he will define your hero. Do you agree with that? or I, I agree with that. Okay. I agree with that. I think the villain drives the plot. The hero is not the person who drives the plot. It's always the uh, the bad guy. Yeah, exactly, because, uh, you know, I've, I've heard uh, writers talk about that um, you know, again, go to go back to movie references, uh, Star Wars, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo would not be interesting if it weren't for Darth Vader because they wouldn't exactly have anybody. Right. Yeah, they wouldn't have anybody to be a foil against. So that's right. I've I've heard the giant killer needs a giant. Exactly. You know. I... Now, um, let's see. Now, you taught, you said, for 17 years, and I've read some of, I read one article that you wrote uh, that was really excellent and fascinating. I mean, I could really tell that you were very much a professor for a number of years teaching writing, and one of the things that you uh, talked about I wanted to bring up because, especially for young writers, they think so much about this. Um you were talking about editing your work, cutting it to the essence with no fluff. And I got yeah. thinking about what you were saying, and I was wondering, is the short story some of the most brutal writing there is? Because first, you're so limited in your uh, word count that there's no room for flowery prose or to go off on rabbit trails. And, and then... Uh, you still have to keep everything so succinct and, and you can't, you just, you can't go anywhere else. You got to stay on point. Um, so then my question is, is uh, short stories in many ways much more brutal a process than say the novel and whether it is or not, how do you edit? What's your process? Okay. First, I think uh, many people do feel short stories are as difficult. Good short stories are as difficult to write as good novels. Some, some, some feel that good short stories are harder to write than good novels, just for what you, because of what you've mentioned. They have to be short, they have to be tight and compact and without wasting any words, and they, they don't have the luxury of subplots, usually. I mean, everything, everything has, to be, um, has to be tight, tightly written. That spills over and, and, and determines a lot about how you have to edit short stories. And, and that means that instead of saying he ran down the street, you need to say, uh, or certainly he ran quickly down the street, you say he sprinted, you know. Right. Uh, the, the, tr the, tr the truck didn't uh, drive noisily down the road. It rumbled down. The you, need to, you need to pick words that, uh, that say what you want to mean in the fewest number of words, which is a good way to do it anyway. Uh, what I do with my editing, and this is not the way a lot of people do it, I write the whole thing, no matter how long the piece is, how long the story is. It might be two pages, it might be 20 pages. I write the whole thing first in one bad first draft, just to get it down on paper. Then I go back and, and try to patch the holes and try to try to polish it and make it better, Okay. And, um, again, there, there's several ways of doing that. I know one lady uh, who, who writes, the way she writes is she'll write every page and make it as perfect as it can be before going on to the next page, and then makes that page as perfect it, as it can be before going on. So she tells me when she's through, she doesn't have to edit anymore. She's done. Well, I can't even imagine doing that because what happens with me is I'll have little different ideas as I go through it, things I want to change, and that could have changed what I wrote on page one. So I have to go through and get it down on paper first, then go back and uh, kind of do a triage deal, I guess, where you, 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 you patch up the worst things first, and then you look for the little bitty things like the commas and punctuation and so forth until it shines. I do like the re-editing process, the rewriting process, I think, is fun. A lot of people say, oh, Lord, that's the worst part. 
uh, having to rewrite is the hardest and the worst part. To me, it's not. To me, it's fun to try to make what you put down on paper really shine and really, really, really work well. And that polishing is, is fun for me. Well, then along, in the, along those same lines, how, um, how much do editors influence or change your writing? Um, I don't think this is the case, but do you resent it when they change things or put in uh, comments or suggestions? Yeah, it depends. Um, I, I, I can honestly say I resent it when they change things just because they can. I think you know what I mean there. Yes. Um, but sometimes uh, certain editors have pointed out things that um, I think make my stories better. You, you do need to understand, or writers need to understand that with these short stories when you send them in, many, many times, not a lot of editing is done to your story when the editor, if the editor gets it. Because in the old days, People could look at maybe one of Faulkner's stories or, you know, the, the stories from long ago, and editors would say back then, whoa, this shows a lot of promise. I think we could whip it into shape. These days, there's so many submissions coming in from everywhere, usually electronically, you know what I mean, emailed in, oh, yeah. that, um, that if it, you know what, if, it's, if it doesn't work, if it's not in real good shape to start with, it gets rejected, and they'll go to the next one. So... It's more important, I feel sure, it's more important now than it ever was to make your story as perfect as it can possibly be before it ever gets sent out to the editor. Uh, I've published a ton of stories in, in Ellery Queen and, and, and Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, Strand Magazine, and I don't think I've ever had anything edited. And uh, certainly not in Alfred Hitchcock and Ellery Queen, they've never edited a word, which tells me that, you know what, if, if they hadn't liked it, they, if they don't like it, they're not going to buy it. Um, other places will edit uh, what you've written, and some of them will do line editing. They actually put in commas that you didn't have or take out commas that you do and so forth. And that's their right, okay? I mean, if you're going to sell it to them, you're going to get paid for it. They can do that. The way I comfort myself there is that if they put in too many changes, I can always change it right back to the way it was when I sell it again. I want to sell it as a reprint. That's one advantage short story writers have over novelists is they can sell their work over and over again to different places. So uh, if they do change something up, let's say change my ending up, so forth. Now, if it's a big change, they will ask you about it, whether it's okay to do it. And I went through that just the other day with an anthology editor. I said, can I change such and such? And I usually, I usually say, yeah, sure. I mean, you can change that up a little bit if you want to, because I'll change it right back to the way it was when I send it someplace else. Um, most editors won't fool with it. If, if your stuff's not well, done well enough to start with, they won't buy it. Others will buy it and ask you to change some things, and my policy there is usually to change it, it's usually fairly minor, when the editor asks to do it. Right. Right. Well, this sounds so much like the uh, illustration world. You know, I work uh, a lot as an illustrator. Right. I also do a lot with the movie industry. And, um, <laughs> you know, when you give them a painting, whether it's being used in a movie or in a magazine, they may change it. They may change it where you don't really recognize it. And uh, at the end of the day, a lot of it is, did you get paid? There's your compensation. I know. And, I know. That's true. And then I also tell my students, I tell this, I think every single uh, time I do a seminar or a workshop, I tell students, never fall in love with something that can't right. love you back. That's right. And uh, a story, a piece of artwork is not going to love you back. And if it gets changed you know, you got paid. You you weren't out digging a ditch that day. So, um, right. That's that's a good thought. Yeah. And and you and you know what, Bill? You could, titles get changed a lot too. Titles get changed. Novel short stories too. Editors will suggest uh, using a different title, and that's happened to me several times. Again, with certain publications, Woman's World is a. It's a little women's magazine that comes out every week. Grocery stores, Target, uh, Walmart, places like that, and I've sold. Gosh, the other day I sold my 119th story to to Woman's World. They have little one mystery and one romance in every issue, and they're very, very short, very, very short. And so I like those because the little mysteries have a little they have a little clue that has to be solved and so forth. It's fun to write. 
they change. They will a lot of times they will want to change my titles, and of course I I tell them that you know and let and let them do that. I sometimes think you know what maybe their title was better than mine. Uh, sometimes I think that it was not as good as mine. Sometimes it will be necessary to change it because unknown to me, last week or last month they might have published one with a similar title, so they need to change it that way. Uh, but you do need to be flexible that way. Most of the time, I don't like the title changes. I wrote a little story once about a kidnapping and a kidnapping and a robbery. They they robbed a guy named Ron and kidnapped him. And um, and so my title was "Take the Money and Run." And I just thought that was the coolest. I thought the coolest title. I just love that title. Well, they changed it to something. I don't know what it was. Candy Camera or something. They changed it to to something else, and I let them do it. But the next time I saw that story, you know. You, you, you change it back again. So um, you have to be flexible, and you have to realize that, sure enough, like you said, they're paying me for that. It's, it's, it's theirs at that point, though you do keep rights. You could talk about that, too. It, it's there, and they have the right to change those things. Right. Um, well, you know, this leads to another question that I've sort of altered a little bit after reading, uh, again, something uh, you had written. Um I was going to ask, you know, you've written, I guess, over 300 stories. How do you prevent becoming repetitive? And you wrote uh, in an article about uh, the what ifs. And uh, you remember that? I do. I think it was, uh, it might have been something on getting ideas for yes, stories. Maybe yes. Was, yeah. Yes. Would you talk about that? Because I, I found, especially that first one, you know, what if it looks like a, a rich woman in her wedding dress is headed to her wedding, but she's locked herself out of her car and she steals a car to get to her wedding or something like that. And it's like, <laughs> yes, that's outrageous, but, you know, weirder things have happened. Well, what would happen uh, if that did transpire? And uh, I was wondering if you would just talk about how you go through the what ifs, what, how that gets uh, sparked. Yeah, I think the question that writers get more often than any other, I certainly book signings question I always get more often than any other, is how do you get your ideas? And writers hate to get that question, not because it's a bad question, but because there's just no good answer for that. I mean, the ideas are every place. Ideas are every place. And uh, I've often told my students, look at your family, look at your friends, your co-workers, look at headlines in the paper, look at, you know, watch movies. Think of little things that start off with just very little, just some little tiny thing, and then ask, what if such and such happened that made that different or outlandish or, or interesting or dangerous? Uh, and, and, and so many times that can happen. And sometimes these little ideas can be just, I think I mentioned in that article, gosh, I think I said something like, it can start as just a little glimmer. It doesn't have to be a beacon just blaring in your head. It can start as just a little glimmer of an idea, and then you maybe can put it with another idea and make it a workable plot. Uh, once I, I worked for IBM Forever, and they sent me six times to Alaska, and, and on one of those trips, uh, the guy I worked with up there was scuba diving. He loved to go scuba diving. And um, and he said, you know, the only thing, that the problem is, he said, I could fly to the kind of the Caribbean and, and, and dive, just scuba dive. He said, but what I have to remember is you can't get on a plane, you can't board a plane uh, less than 24 hours after your dive or you'll die because of the pl pressure difference oh, and those kinds of things. And I thought, whoa, I, that's wild. And, and so I thought that could be that could be an idea maybe first. Of all. And then shortly after that, I was traveling all the time back then. I wound up going to Hong Kong. I went across the international date line. And I had to go over there for I And I've forgotten whether you lose a day or gain a day. But when you go over the date the date line, going in one direction or the other, then you you sure enough you lose a day, a day or gain a day. And I thought, what if I put those two ideas together? And um, and make a story out of it, and I did. And so I got back home on the trip, as a matter of fact, I, and I sold it to, to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. And the, So the thing is, you can take these little pieces that are just fascinating. If they're fascinating to you, if you hear some little tidbit that's fascinating to you, odds are it's going to be fascinating to a reader, too. Right. And, um, and just make a note of those. 
Uh, if you happen to think about it in the middle of the night, don't forget it. You know, <laughs> it might be a good idea to get up and write it down because in the morning you'll think, "Oh, I had this great idea, but I can't." Oh, I remember now it's a great idea, and uh, and then kind of build those up, maybe combine them, uh, and you can form a story out of that. But the main thing is get a situation, say, "What if such and such happened?" And then, "What if such and such happened on top of that?" And then you know what? Then what if? And pretty soon you got a plot going out right um well let's move in, in this same sort of in this same direction you also wrote about injecting humor into your story even the most serious story because you're saying that one it's it's more enjoyable to write it's more enjoyable to read and it's easier to sell uh people just seem to like it better but you emphasized that you weren't necessarily talking about injecting slapstick or anything like that but it was just something even in the most serious story just to make people smile and yeah. talk about that because uh, one of the things I'm, I'm sure you don't really use any crude humor as such and I remember I think it was Ed McMahon talking about how lazy crude humor was that he said <laughs> you know talk about make a joke about eating an orange now do that without injecting sex or scatological content yeah, yeah. and you'll find that's really difficult and so uh and and i know that uh a lot of screenwriters again talk about how frustrating it is that comedy is far harder to write than drama and yet it's not taken nearly as seriously especially like at the academy awards that's or something so that's talk about the difficulty with writing humor and 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 how you deal with that because it's such a subjective uh, phenomena. It is well. I think one good thing about uh, about putting the humor humor into a story is that you're putting things on paper that you can go through and look at and polish and make it right before anybody ever sees it. If somebody's talking to you and you're trying to be witty on a date or a or you're you know, some kind of party or whatnot, you wind up getting home and you think, whoa, I wish I had said such and such. You know, that would have been a cool thing to say. Well, with writing, you can you can do that. You can go back and over and over again, You have and, and you can play with it until it sounds neat. It sounds cool. Sometimes it's just this back and forth uh, with dialogue can be a great way to inject humor. And, uh, and, and, and I, so I try to do, I try to do a lot of that. The the fact that stories have sure enough stories that have humor in them are easier to sell. I'm, I'm convinced that a story of let's say it's it's, it's of a certain we have two stories of the same quality. It's two stories really the same quality, the same length, and so forth. One of them has a good bit of humor. One doesn't. The one with humor in it is going to be easier to sell. I know it is. It's just is easier to sell. Um. Because people like that, people like to laugh. Uh, you can inject it into serious stories. Uh, Thomas Harris with Gosh with Hannibal and and uh, Silence of the Lambs. That was you were all through those, and that's some of the grittiest novels I've ever read in my life. Right. Uh, but some of the hardest subject matter you can imagine, and um, and there were some funny things in there, and that's a good thing when you can inject that. It's, um, I don't know, call it common relief, whatever. Maybe the easiest things as you go along. Jerry Seinfeld said once that, um, that crude humor and uh, obscenities and those kinds of things in a comedy act, a stand-up act, is a cheap way to get laughs. And he says the really talented comedians and comedy writers don't use it. Because it is, it, it's a cheap, easy way. So he says the best ones don't do that. So there are ways that you can put humor into a story. You can have a character just not take himself too seriously. Right. You know? I mean, think about Thomas Magnum, the people like that, and and, and our Maverick. Remember the old Western? Oh, yeah. And, and some, sometimes the way, just the way a character acts just doesn't take himself too seriously is a good thing. Or Banner, back and forth between Butch Casting and Sundance Kid, Lethal Weapon. Banner, uh, banner back and forth between two main characters. Wonderful way to inject humor into um, into a story. Uh, one of the series that I've had the most success with is as a retired grumpy school teacher 
who um, her student is the um, the sheriff, a former student in fifth grade, was is now her sheriff in her little town. And so she now helps him solve mysteries, uh, whether he wants her to or not, kind of, you know, and she just she just really aggravates him to death. It's almost like if it were A.B. telling Sheriff Taylor, you know, how to do his job. And so that that humor that's there in that has absolutely helped me sell those those stories. And and the great thing about it, the best thing about it maybe, is the readers not only like it, but it's fun to write. The writers have a great time doing that. Yes. Now, this actually leads me to what was going to be my next question, because I was reading, and I'm, I'm just uh, having to look at some of my notes here. Uh, you've you've written more than 100 mysteries with Angela Potts, uh, uh, bossy retired school teacher Angela yeah, Potts, that's her, yeah. and her yeah. former fifth grade student Charles Chunky Jones, who is now the sheriff. That's him. You've also written eighty, more than eighty stories with Fran, the Fran and Lucy stories, uh, better known as the Law and Daughter series, and then right. la- lastly, you've got another series, uh, eight feature, uh, his eighth features. New Orleans shop owner, Madam Zufu, is that right? <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of a voodoo lady in New Orleans. That's become a kind of a series. I have a series of a Mississippi sheriff named Ray Douglas, Raymond Douglas, Raymond Kirk Douglas is his name, and, uh, and his girlfriend is a lawyer named Jennifer Parker. And th- those, uh, those, that series has been, I've sold seven now, no, eight of those to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine, and one's been published in another magazine called Down and Out Magazine, and so those are fun to write also. I, was, I was even have a series about an Old West private investigator and his brother, and, uh, and series are fun to write, and, uh, and actually they wind up being sometimes easier to write than other stories, especially if they're really short, because if the readers have come to know the characters, and you know the characters well too, then you don't have to spend as much time um, introducing them in the stories, in subsequent stories, before you get into the plot. So it's almost a time saver uh, when, you, when you have a series that's caught on a bit. So I've been real, real fortunate fortunate there. I, I sometimes tell mystery writers, whether they're novelists or short story writers, every story you write, at least consider the fact that you might want to make that into a series later. Uh, in other words, end it in a way that might allow you to make, to, to make it into a series. Right. One of the things I'm curious about, and I know uh, a lot of people are, is how do you get into the head of someone who is so completely different than yourself. You know, I'm assuming right. like this uh, retired school teacher, this is maybe a, a woman in her 60s, 70s or something like that, and right. you are not a 70-year-old woman. So, uh, and especially her not being a peripheral character, now, you know, she's a character with a hundred stories under your, under her belt, and over that many stories, you've had to really flesh her out. Okay, where are you getting uh, this char- the characteristics of this character from, and and not creating just a caricature, but a real live woman that someone who is exactly like her, a retired school teacher, could go, yep, John really knows what it's like. He he, this this character reads true. How do you get that? Well, I do think you have to be careful about that. I think it's actually risky when you do write uh, from the viewpoint of someone who is way different from you all, from what you are. Um, writing from the viewpoint of a woman, I don't find is really terribly hard. I'll tell you what I try not to do sometimes is I try not to write in first person if it's a character very, very different from myself. I'll, I'll still write in third person uh, all right, but it would still be about that character. You see what I mean? So yeah. it's not saying, I did this, I did that. And that seems to distance me a little more and be a little more comforting than, than writing in first person, though I have done that. The main thing is, if you feel like, if you really feel like you can put yourself in that situation enough and you understand enough about the character, then you can do it. 
it's it's, it's risky, Bill. That's uh, I, I I don't think I I could attempt to write maybe a short story about let's say um uh an eight a uh, nineteenth century uh, Native American woman something like that. I think that would just be too big a reach. Okay, um, but if it's but if it's somebody that's let's say present day um, somebody whose experiences I can relate to enough, I think you can do that. Um, it, it does. It does help if you're going to do something really kind of risky that way to have a reader uh, who who you trust enough to to read it first and tell you what uh, what he or she thinks. Okay, right. I don't do that a lot. My wife does read some of that stuff, um, and she'll tell because I know she'll tell me. Look, I mean, this just doesn't work. But but so many people will let their uh, their spouses or their girlfriend or boyfriend or their best friend read their stuff. And you have to be very careful about that because they're going to want you to feel good. I mean, they, they are, the main thing is they're going to want you to feel good. My mother would have liked, she would have liked anything that I wrote in that, and she would have told me that. Um, but, you, but you need honest opinions there. I think it's okay, and I think it's possible to write from the viewpoint of uh, a person of another gender, Person, I think another race might be harder because maybe we might not feel like we know those, those folks as well. Um, who is James Patterson writes the Alex Cross novels, and uh, that, that's a black a black man, black detective. Um, he's also written some. Um, gosh, it was a Sidney Sheldon. Almost all his novels, I think, were first person um, from a woman's point of view. You can do it if you're good enough to do that. Um, but well, you have to be, yeah, you're right. You have to be careful. Yeah, I think just from other people, other writers that I've listened to and then my own experience, a lot of it is just uh, doing the research. Are you willing to put in the research? I mean, you can have yeah. a caricature of a particular person, but, you know, especially if you're writing, you know, I think about Stephen King and he writes these huge novels that have many, many characters in them. And right. they're all over the place, <clears throat> young black women, old old Indian men. Right. Know, just, it's everywhere. And they seem to read true, but there again, I think he's probably doing a tremendous amount of research. And I know for myself, I've written a few, a couple of uh, novels and, a, and a, a number of short stories and some children's books. And my wife has been an excellent resource because... Right. Uh, for for that, especially with the children, she can look and and say, no, a seven year old doesn't talk like that. You know, or, <laughs> right. uh, or what would surprise me very often was just how sophisticated children are. You know, you forget right. when you get in your fifties and sixties just how sophisticated children are, and so you start That's writing, true. and you forget that uh, they they they're clueless in so many ways, but then mm-hmm. on, on other levels, they're really not. They may not have it all worked out in their head, but they know something's going on. And so right. you have to be careful not to write an eight-year-old as if they're four. Right, right. So, but isn't that viewpoint important, Bill? It's just so important to get the right viewpoint through which to tell a story. You is. know, I, I heard once that the best way to determine that, because students worry about this kind of thing a lot, um, is who is in the best position to tell the story, or who will be most impacted by the story? Uh, you think of uh, you think of novels like *To Kill a Mockingbird*. Uh, Atticus Finch, as, as as great a character as he is, was not the viewpoint character in that story. It was his, it was it was his daughter, right. you know, the scout, because she stood to learn more from what happened. Uh, in the Great Gatsby, it wasn't Gatsby at all. It was whatever his name was, Nick Carraway, across who lived across the sound, and he was he was the one who um, who saw all this happening. So it was told through his viewpoint. And Shane was a little boy, the Western gunfighter. Uh, he was a title character, but it wasn't his story. It was the little boy. He was so influenced by him. So the the, the viewpoint character is so important that. Uh, you, you have to you have to feel like you're comfortable in that person's skin before you uh, before you take on something like that. I think it's a short story, or a novel, or whatever. It's just so important. Yeah. Let me jump to something else. We were um, we talked about something earlier, and it got me into this question that I had. Again, I was listening to a, a screenwriter who was talking to a class of potential screenwriters, 
and he was saying that there's a difference between commercial and literary fiction. And he yes. said, commercial fiction has a closed resolution, so I guess we get all the answers at the end, whereas the literary fiction has an open-ended resolution, it's not so much a cliffhanger, but we just never find out certain things about the character or the story. And at, I think and, that's true. And at the same time, he said commercial will be more external in its, <clears throat> excuse me, that commercial will be more external in its development, so it's more action-packed, whereas literary will be more interior, like more yep. cerebral in the mind. Okay, so obviously you agree with that. Um, I do. Can you, he didn't give any examples or whatever. Could you give some examples and sort of expound on that just a little bit? Yeah, I think literary fiction, I heard once that the gauge that you should use, whether your story is literary or commercial or sometimes called genre fiction, is the extent by which the main character is changed throughout the course of the story. If your story... Uh, at the end, of, if at the end of the story, your main character has learned a life lesson, and has has he has changed, is a different person. At the end of the story, you've written a piece of literary fiction. That's and I think that's a really, really good um, way to 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 decide which it is. Um, and example, gosh, examples would be uh, well, The Great Gatsby for one. I think. Um, Examples would be uh, Great Expectations, maybe Dead Poets Society, maybe um, the, the 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 big literary novels are the one One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where things where, where views actually change from the first story to the end. A genre story would be uh, a James Bond movie or a uh, Nancy Drew novel or, or something where the the main character doesn't change from the beginning to the end. Matter of fact, readers don't really much want him or her to change because it's, sometimes it's a series and it keeps going, right? Uh, so the right. character, big character arc isn't there for commercial fiction or genre fiction, but that's okay. Usually the readership is bigger, <laughs> believe it or not, for commercial fiction, if I was called that, I guess, commercial fiction than for literary, than for literary fiction. Um, Stephen King said one time, if you, uh, he says, if, 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 You've written, you know, great literary fiction. He says you may very well be sitting down to an Alpo and Noodles casserole every night because not a lot of people are going to be uh, buying your work. He says the, the beach reads, easy reads, a lot of times will sell better, though the critics will love the the uh, the literary fiction. That's kind of interesting to, to me. It always has, has been interesting. And some people say, too, that literary fiction is more character driven than genre fiction, which is more plot driven. Right. In other words, they're looking more for great, interesting, deep characters on the literary side, and they're looking for a great story, bang up story right. uh, and, on the commercial or genre side. And some of this, of course, you know, you and I are kind of old hands at what we've been doing, so we've been doing for a very long time. And so I'm sort of gearing this toward the young person, the student who's right. just starting out and thinking about um, that very often there's this idea that literary is is more profound or better than uh, commercial, that there is, it's on a higher level. But in my estimation, one example I think about the, if you, you've heard of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Right. Okay. Well, when... He was being interviewed, the writer that he talked about that when he was in his college writing class, he would be writing all these vampire stories and the teacher didn't like it. And the other students, I think, kind of looked down on him because he wasn't trying to write this real profound stuff. He was writing these silly vampire stories. Well, at the end of the day, <clears throat> probably not one of those other students have ever been published. However, for better or for worse, Buffy the Vampire Slayer has been a huge cultural phenomena and yes. influenced not only the people in this, this country, but around the world. And so, especially if you're wanting to have a profound effect on uh, the rest of society, writing the great American novel 
may not be your path to that, but <laughs> but actually a Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's right. Um, well, well, John Grish. I think John Grisham would tell you uh, would tell you immediately that he's not uh, a literary author. Right. Yeah, uh, Stephen King is not either, though he has he's, he's eased over into it several times with a novel called Bare Bones uh, and uh, uh, several short stories, uh, The Man in the Black Suit, several that, that were literary. But he will tell you that he's a genre author and, and, and not ashamed of it, you know? Yes, yes. Well, along that lines, is do you read or uh, look at other genres much, I mean, other than um, – detective fiction i mean obviously with us dialoguing back and forth you know things like buffy the vampire slayer so obviously right. you've at least seen some right what would it be teen fantasy type sh uh, tv shows do you try to immerse yourself in as broad a spectrum as possible oh yeah i, I like to try to uh, to watch all gosh a lot of different genres uh, of movies and, and read a lot of different genres of short stories and novels too now i do love mystery suspense because that's just kind of what i what i like the most but um but last night um our grandchildren two of our grandchildren were here and we watched the princess bride again oh, princess yeah. bride is is fantasy adventure um gosh it's it's, it's comedy it's, it's a bunch of different genres all Group together. William Goldman, the screenwriter, screenwriter, you know, wrote *The Princess Bride*, and um, I, I think um, I think it's I think any of us I think writers can learn from any kind of reading that we do or any kind of movies that that we watch. And man, I like a lot of different kinds of uh, kinds of genres. Yeah, is there any other genre other than detective fiction? It's like okay, if you had the opportunity, or someone said, okay, we will pay you to go on and take the plunge, take the time. Is there another genre that you would take the plunge in? It's something really different than what you normally do. I tell you what, I love westerns. I love westerns, probably because I grew up when you did, back when westerns were so popular. And um, uh, my, my story in this month, March, April, Saturday Evening Post, is a western. It's about a 4,000-word western. Uh, if, if a literary guy was asking me about that story, I'd probably tell him, oh, you know what, it's historical fiction. <laughs> you know? right. but, it, but truly, it's a Western. Well, you there's, not, it's not a lot of shoot 'em up going on, but, they, but, it's, but it's that time period, and it's, uh, it's a genre that I do really like. Well, I will tell you, um, in the studio, you know, I'm listening to books on tape and sermons and things like that, but... What's really interesting is I've listened to genres that I never would have thought about reading. You, uh, it was interesting you talking about uh, westerns. I love watching westerns, but it never occurred to me to ever read a western. It just didn't right. seem appealing until one of my favorite writers of all time is Lauren D. Estelman. And I yep. don't remember his detective, the, the, his main protagonist detective. It just... He had this wonderful series that I just loved, and I listened to That's every, true. everything Indeed, I could get. But then, one day, there was a Western at the library, and it's like, well, I don't care much about Westerns, I don't think. But it was by Lauren D. Estelman, and so it's like, well, I got to listen. It was amazing, because it wasn't, you know, what I would consider. And again, I love, I love, grew up on Bonanza, and... Uh, have gun will travel all that stuff but again just the sitting down reading it I just i had this stereotype in my mind that it's just going to be another bonanza uh episode this estelman uh western was just one of the best things i'd ever listened to and so i just i thought it was very interesting you uh as a same as estelman a mystery writer all of a sudden coming in going yeah i'd, I'd write a, a, a western well, yeah, Lauren Estelman has written a bunch of westerns uh, and 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 mystery, and I say mystery crime novels. Crime, yeah. when I'm saying mysteries, and uh, and and Elmore Leonard started out with westerns. Now he wrote Three Ten to Yuma and, and the Tall T and and uh, gosh, he wrote Ombre. Remember the Paul Newman movie Ombre? Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, Elmore Leonard wrote all those. So there are a lot. Bill Conzini wrote a lot of. You know, he was a crime writer. 
wrote a lot of westerns. I think um, I think there's similarities there. I think the um, the the black white uh, uh, good versus evil kind of thing is probably bigger in westerns than maybe in some other genres where you know the guy that wears the black hat or white hat that's still kind of that's still kind of the case and um, they're fun to write. It's just fun to write. Yeah. At the end, you feel justice has been served. Right. You know what I mean? I do, yes. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Uh, since we're talking about genres, again, I was reading something you had written about that uh, there were dozens, if not a hundred, different types of defect- detective fiction and there are, sub-genres. Yes. And could you, I didn't write them all down. You know, I think of, you know, noir and uh, maybe teen or something, but could you list five or six or so and then tell the listeners where you feel like your writing fits in for those who aren't familiar with your work? Okay. Uh, one, you mentioned noir, which is kind of, you think of dark, you think of some uh, dark, old-timey, black-and-white movies with uh, Venetian blind shadows on the floor, that kind of thing. You know, you think of noir, and someone said that in, in noir, you always have uh, a woman who is way smarter than the man who talks to the guy into doing things that just get him in a lot of trouble. You know, you think of double indemnity in some of those. Um, so, so noir fiction is a big deal. Um and I do like that. I like writing that. Uh, another is, uh, is 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 comedy fiction, is lighthearted uh, fiction, which is fun. Which I think probably my little Angela Potts uh, stories that you mentioned probably fall into. Which which is and, and you know what? In a way, Ocean's Eleven is almost almost fits that They're lighthearted uh, fiction. You know. Um, Another one would be cozies, which a lot of ladies that I know just love cozy mysteries. And those are usually where the action happens off screen and the crime is solved by an amateur sleuth in a, in a, uh, a, a close, tight knit community. And you think about, uh, I don't know, Miss Marple and people like that when you, when you think of those. And I just finished writing a cozy. Uh, yesterday, which I planned to send into anthology, so cozy mysteries. Hard boiled is another um, genre, subgenre of mystery that's uh, just real gritty and um, uh, adult oriented, and um, many many people love that. Historical mystery is another bill that's just self explanatory, but uh, so many of those are are so good. They're set back in Victorian England, or you know. Uh, those 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 are those are fun. Those are fun as well. Where and would you cl- where would you go ahead, go ahead. where would you put Mrs. Polyfax? Oh gosh, I don't know. I guess you'd that's um it, it's probably well it's an it's not a police procedural. It's it's more of a um is Probably it, more of a cozy, oh, okay. I would say. I was you know what I mean? It was a cozy, yes. And, uh, it's kind of an amateur, well, amateur sleuth. You know what I mean? Is, are, are a couple of your characters like that? Um, yes, some of them are. They okay. are. I've got, I've got two or three that are. You know why? It's because those are, the reader can so easily identify with that kind of a character. Because we're not talking about a seasoned police detective or, or, or some kind of a forensic investigator. You're talking about... A, almost a regular person, right? You know, and and so the reader identification is there. Uh, I think in that kind of, and, and I think probably that accounts for the popularity of uh, of, of cozy mysteries, right? Um, now we've been going for over an hour. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry, no, I, I'm, no, I'm talking no. too much. No, not at all. The only problem is uh, I've still got a little bit, but uh, I'm looking up at my uh, recorder and how much time I've got left on it. Uh, that that little chip that fills up all too quickly. Uh, this is so wonderful. Uh, I, but I don't want to let you go without a couple of things. First okay. of all, um, you've got a new work. Either it's coming out or it's already come out that you were talking about was poems. And didn't I hear you say something about that? Some were like children's poems? or, or uh, Tell us about well, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Gosh, I'm not sure that children's poems, but they are. Uh, they're all funny. There's nothing okay. adult oriented in them. Okay. Uh, all of them. 
all of them are short. It's just this just light verse. It's uh, 300 different poems that my publisher kind of taught me into. He said, he, he said, I think this would just be a lot of fun to do. And I said, no, that's going to be too much of one of one thing. And he said, well, I don't think so. He says, I think if we, if we present it the right way, that it's not... If, see, see, Bill, when I talk, I've got a little thing in the foreword in the foreword of that book that says if you're looking for um, if if you're looking for uh, inspiration or enlightenment or insights into the meaning of life, uh, you probably don't look elsewhere. You know, I mean, this is just this is just funny, crazy stuff. I've got this I've got this in front of me. It's called Lighten Up. It's called Lighten Up a Little, and it's got um, here's one that says. Um, some are some are some are limericks. Some are just four line poems. Some are here's one that says um, an old Kansas farmer named Ben had a mule kick him square in the chin. As he whipped out his gun, he saw three mules, not one, and the middle one kicked him again. <laughs> so I mean, it's just a little cra- just crazy stuff. But it's things that editors love because they can find room to put them a lot of times into <clears throat> you know into a publication. Yeah. So I've sold a ton of them over the years. Here's one that says, since I'm quite debonair, I don't travel by air, Leonard bragged from the helm of his yacht. A storm came the next day and blew Leonard away. I don't know if they found him or not. <laughs> so this is so this is not this is not profound literature here, okay, but it's just it's fun fun stuff. Oh, but you know, and I can't think of his name, but there was a guy who uh he would write and illustrate these little limericks like that of uh, well, it sounds macabre, but of children meeting terrible ends, and uh, it's, it's <laughs> yes, y- yes. Uh, we had a calendar of it in our kitchen, and and each one. I mean, it sounds horrible, but it was just it was funny and uh, lighthearted. But um, uh, this is a super famous guy, so uh, you know, um, if you don't like that kind of humor, I'm sorry. But uh, right. this sort of reminded me of that. Uh, yeah. And and uh, it's kind of Ogden Nash kind of. Do you remember Ogden Nash? Oh yeah. It's, it's kind of his his kind of, of poetry. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Tell everyone how they can get your work and how they can even get in touch with you. I know you got a website, so tell everybody you know how they can get your work, how they can find you. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, I, yeah, my website is www.johnmfloyd dot com m from Madison John M Floyd dot com, um, and it's got some uh, some links in there to places to get my books. I do have uh, eight books, a ninth one coming out soon. Uh, one place to get signed copies of the books would be at dogwoodpress dot com. That's dogwoodpress one word dot com, and uh, I think all the books are now on Am- there on Amazon as well. So you could find you could find them there. Okay. All right. Well, was there anything else you want to share about your work or anything with the listeners? Uh, the only thing I, I guess I should mention is I do have a story in this current issue, March, April issue of the Saturday Evening Post, if you happen to see it. Uh, and then the March, April issue of uh, Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine that just came out. I have a story in there. Okay, and that's it's 2021. Those, that's 2021. It's, I'm sorry, it's 2021. Yes. Those are current. And then the current Strand Magazine which is the old one that dates back to Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie uh, years ago. So I have a story in that one. And the current Black Cat Mystery Magazine, which came out several years ago, has become now a major mystery magazine. So I've got stories in several current uh, current issues and just having a great time with this, Bill. It's just so much fun. Well, oh, thank you. This, John, as always, this is just a delight to talk to you, and I appreciate you coming on the show and talking to my listeners and my viewers on YouTube. Uh, it's just been a real treat for me. Thank you, Bill. And, hey, I really appreciate you having me on. Honor, it's an honor to be on. Thank you. You are so welcome. And I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist. If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist.